Okay, so let's finish up and then we're going to go through one other problem in the revenue cycle. So we left off, we were talking about the, the key steps in, in our audit approach. And um, so we tested controls and uh, tested transactions. And so the next step is, remember, under substantive tests, you can ha you're going to have substantive tests of transactions, substantive tests of detailed balances, and substantive analytical procedures. Those are the three types of substantive procedures that you can perform. As I pointed out before uh, last week, substantive tester transactions and, and tester controls can be performed simultaneously. Right? And so that's why you saw in the previous problem that we just went over what we call dual purpose tests. You can perform an audit procedure and gather information not only about the control, the effectiveness of that control, uh, and, or that that control is operating effectively, but also gather information about the, account, the transactions, right? Um, the transaction amount. With um, analytical procedures at this phase of the audit, in the evidence gathering phase, it is not mandatory. It is not a mandatory step. It is up, it is within the auditor's judgment whether or not they use substantive analytical procedures. Most times in most audits they will. The, amount of analytical procedures or the extent of substantive analytical procedures they perform is really going to de depend again on the audit risk model um, and, and their assessment of detection risk. So uh, some of the analytical procedures that are common in the sales and revenue cycle is obviously step, you know, look at accounts, uh, sales from one period to the next. Look at changes in accounts receivable. Look at the change in allowance for doubtful accounts. Does it make sense? What is, uh, you know, s the accounts receivable as a percentage of, of sales? Uh, accounts receivable as compared to sales. If we see that accounts receivable so rising, but we're not, we're seeing that sales are flat or sales are going in the opposite direction, that relationship doesn't make sense. So we'd want to investigate, well, why would that be the case? And obviously, you do ratio analysis, days, uh, you know, days sales outstanding, uh, number of days in sales, those types of uh, analytical, those types of ratios you would use. In terms of the test of detail balances, you're trying to get information or gather evidence about accounts such as accounts receivable, the allowance for doubtful accounts. And so what you're concerned with, again, is then you're going to look at those assertions and design your tests around those assertions related to assertions about account balances, such as existing. So you want to make sure that recorded accounts receivable exist. Um, you want to, we went through, in that example, we saw different types of tests you would perform to test the valuation of, a, of accounts receivable by looking at allowance for doubtful accounts. So you want to also make sure that accounts receivable is complete. Existing accounts receivable, all accounts receivable that should be included have been included in the account, that it's accurate, that it's properly classified, that you're not reflecting, let's say, um, intercompany sales uh, or um, third um, uh, related party receivables in accounts receivable. This accounts receivable should only reflect trade receivables. Um, that, uh, that the cutoff is appropriate. Right. So again, this is something that you would look, in, look at in conjunction with your testing of cut, cutoff related to sales. Um, that they're stated at its net realizable value. That's your testing of the allowance for doubtful accounts. You want to make sure that accounts receivable hasn't been factored. Right? That the company didn't sell accounts receivable. One, again, what you're concerned about, they have the rights to those accounts receivable. Um, that is accurately presented and disclosed. Right, so uh, present it, right? We know how we present accounts receivable. It's a current asset, and it should be presented net of allowance for doubtful accounts, right? And then there are usually disclosures about accounts receivable in the footnotes of the financial statements. So those are, uh, so accounts receivable would be, uh, and allowance for doubtful accounts would be the two primary balance sheet accounts that you would look at related to sales and collection. 